No drum machine is really complete without a punchy, snappy snare. Together with the kick, it creates the rhythmic backbone for most grooves. So in my ongoing quest for creating a Roland-inspired modular drum machine, I knew I had to come up with a snare circuit that would complement the kick and hi-hat I've already designed. After a lot of fine-tuning, here's what I landed on. As always when designing a drum voice, I'll start by mapping out the functional blocks we need for a classic analog snare. There are two main components to the sound. The drum, that is a pitched oscillation, and the snare wires, that is the noisy rattling. We'll tackle the drum first. For that, we'll rely on the same percussive sine wave oscillator I used in my kick drum circuit. To give it a punchy attack, we'll then modulate its pitch with a simple envelope. For the snare wire sound, we'll start off with a standard white noise generator. Next, we'll use a VCA, coupled with another envelope generator to shape the noise into a percussive burst. Because this is very bottom heavy, we'll want to filter out a lot of the low end, so that the noise doesn't muddy up the drum sound later. For that, we'll add a rather aggressive high-pass filter to the signal chain. Finally, we just need to mix the two signals together. Sounds like a pretty decent snare drum to me. So let's try and implement this in an actual circuit. We'll start with the percussive oscillator. As I said before, we'll simply repurpose the oscillator I used in my kick drum for this. You can check that video for an in-depth explanation, but here's the basic gist. By plugging a bridged T network consisting of two capacitors and two resistors into the feedback path of an op-amp, we create a highly resonant filter. If we then excite or ping this filter with a quick voltage pulse, it will oscillate for a little bit before eventually settling down. That's why I called this a percussive oscillator. It creates a pitched percussive hit all by itself, without the need for a VCA and an envelope generator. Great. Now, to set the oscillation frequency, we'll have to pick specific values for the resistors and capacitors. For a snare, something in the 100 to 200 Hz range should work fine. Using a 910K bridge resistor, two 33 nanofarads capacitors, and a 470 ohms resistor to ground, combined with a 1K potentiometer, should allow us to roughly cover that range. Now, to actually test this, we'll need a quick voltage pulse, also called a trigger. Thankfully, we can reuse the gate to trigger converter I've come up with in my kick drum video for this. You can find an in-depth explanation in that video, but essentially, the circuit takes a gate signal coming from a sequencer, for example, transforms it into a quick voltage pulse, and then allows you to cap that voltage pulse's height to a given control voltage via the accent CV in. Since even the accented pulse is too hot for our oscillator and would cause it to distort, we'll scale it down using a simple 10K, 1K voltage divider. To test our circuit, I'll use a new project I'm currently working on with my friends at Erica Synths. We call it Labor. It's supposed to make breadboarding synthesizer circuits less of a hassle. In our case, I'm using the internal dual supply to power the circuit, 
the modular interfacing section to connect the potentiometer to the breadboard, the manual gate button to trigger the drum sound, the variable CV source to control the accent level, and the output amplifier to connect the circuit to my audio interface. At some point, we'll also have a little oscilloscope expansion module up here. Unfortunately, that's still in development, so we'll have to make do with a simulated version for now. As expected, we get a short blip every time I push the button. And we can tune it using the potentiometer. Also, we can vary the output volume via the accent CV input. Great. Depending on your use case, you might want to extend the decay of this a little, though. For that, we'll borrow another idea from my kick drum video. Forcing the oscillation to keep going for longer by applying positive feedback to the system. And we do that with an op amp set up as an inverting amplifier with variable gain. By using a 100k potentiometer in parallel with the 47k feedback resistor, we can dial in any amount of gain between 0 and about 0.6, which should give us a decently long tail on the drum sound. And yeah, that seems like a solid range to me. If you want to get more decay out of this, you can simply increase the value of the potentiometer. But for me, this is plenty. Next, I want to add a punchy attack to the drum sound via a pitch envelope. For that, we'll take another cue from my kick drum circuit, bridging the resistance to ground in the oscillator with an NPN transistor. It works like this. If we apply a voltage to the transistor's base, it will allow current to bypass the potentiometer and 470 ohms resistor, heavily reducing the effective resistance to ground and thereby increasing the oscillation frequency. To keep the pitch from going through the roof, we then add a small 330 ohm series resistor, so the effective resistance doesn't drop straight to zero when the transistor is fully open. This will also shift the pitch range downwards a bit, but I prefer lower pitch snares anyway, so I'm okay with that. Next, we'll set up a simple envelope generator that will control the transistor. It works like this. If we apply a trigger to the diode, current will flow into the capacitor, filling it up. Since I want the attack to be consistent at different accent levels, we'll use the full-size trigger instead of the accented one. Then, when the trigger disappears, Current slowly flows from the capacitor through the voltage divider, opening up the transistor in the process. Why do we need the voltage divider though? Wouldn't a single bigger resistor connecting the cap and transistor have the same effect? Not quite, since the transistor wouldn't allow the capacitor to fully discharge. That's because at voltages below 300 to 400 millivolts, barely any current is going to flow into the base and this would prevent the oscillator from settling on its base pitch. By introducing a dedicated path to ground, we fix this, allowing the cap to discharge steadily and completely. And while this works just fine, I feel like the added punch is a little too intense and dominant. To deal with this, we can insert a relatively small resistance after the input diode. This way, charging the capacitor takes a bit longer, and it doesn't get charged up as much, which should result in a smoother, less intense attack. To be able to vary the effect, we combine a 1K resistor with a 5K potentiometer here. As expected, we can now vary the attack's intensity from pretty punchy to really subtle. Great. Right now, our circuit sounds more like a 606 style tom than a snare. That's because we're missing the second main component of the sound, the snare wires. To implement it, we'll first need to set up a white noise generator. Here, we can again reuse part of a circuit I already designed. In my video covering a white, pink and blue noise generator, I came up with this transistor-based white noise core. 
I recommend checking that video for an in-depth explanation, but here's a quick rundown. We wire up a transistor backwards, blasting its emitter with 12 volts, which causes it to break down. This allows for randomly fluctuating amounts of current to flow through the transistor, which causes the voltage below the resistor to fluctuate randomly as well. The rest of the circuit is then simply processing the noise signal. We first center it around the zero volts line via AC coupling, and then we amplify it by a factor of 45, since the original signal is extremely low in volume. As expected, we get a pretty uniform white noise signal out of the generator. Great. Next, we'll need to shape the noise into a percussive burst. For that, we'll go with the swing type VCA that Roland used all over the 606 and 808 drum voices. Again, I did a thorough analysis of this little circuit in my previous video about a 606 style hi-hat, but here's a quick summary. At its core, the VCA is a simple NPN transistor based amplifier. And like in a regular amplifier, we first bias the input signal upwards, so that the transistor is forward active when the signal is idling at ground level. Then, when that signal starts to slightly fluctuate, the transistor oscillates between cutoff and saturation, since its gain is extremely high. This adds a lot of distortion, but it also allows us to reduce the overall volume of the output by lowering the control voltage we apply to the collector resistor. And that's because that control voltage is the output voltage we get when the transistor is in the cutoff state. For good measure, we add a diode to keep the VCA quiet when the control voltage is very low, and a small filtering cap to remove some of the high end added by the distortion. To test this, I've connected the Labor's variable CV source to the VCA's control voltage input. As expected, this allows us to reduce the volume of our noise signal. But I'm noticing some unpleasant high-end hiss still present in our output, despite the filtering cap. I suspect that this is a byproduct of our diode rapidly and randomly opening and closing in sync with the noise signal. So we'll slow that down a touch with yet another 2.2 nanofarads filtering cap on the other side. Seems to work just fine. Great. With the VCA done, we'll now want to add another envelope generator, so we can make our noise match the volume contour of the drum sound. We'll deviate a little from the attack stage envelope design for this, though. First, we don't want the noise to come in gradually, but rather hit at full volume. So we'll omit the resistance between the diode and capacitor. And second, we'll want to control the speed with which the noise fades away to simulate tighter or looser snare wires. For that, we'll put a 100k potentiometer between the capacitor and the VCA's CV input. This way, that potentiometer is working double duty as the resistance that converts the current flowing through the VCA's transistor into a voltage and as the discharging path for the envelope's capacitor. To test this, I'm applying our trigger to the envelope. We'll listen to the noise path in isolation for now. And indeed, we're able to morph the constant noise into percussive bursts of varying lengths. We can even kill it completely. Great. To hear how this would sound mixed together with a drum signal, I'll set up a simple passive mixer using two resistors. To me, that sounds more like a weird combination of a tom and a terrible hand clap. The noise is just way too bottom heavy to pass as snare wires. So let's get rid of that low end by routing the processed noise through an aggressive high pass. For that, we'll use a Salen Key high pass filter. You might recognize this topology from my hi hat video, though I used an op amp instead of a transistor as the active element there. <laughs> 
Essentially, a cell and key filter consists of two passive filter stages and an amplifier chained together. Then the amplified output is routed back into the first filter stage. Adding the amplifier and the feedback does two things. First, it decouples the two filter stages, preventing them from loading each other down and thereby improving the filter's performance. And second, it allows us to introduce resonance. Here, the amount of resonance added depends on the size of this resistor. As a rule of thumb, the smaller the resistor, the more resonance we'll get. Using two 1 nanofarad capacitors with a 100k resistor to ground and a 22k feedback resistor gives us a cutoff frequency of 3.4 kHz and a pronounced bump at that same frequency. For the amplifier, I'm using a simple NPN transistor set up as an emitter follower, with one slight catch. Since our noise signal is swinging around the zero volts line, we need to give the transistor enough headroom to operate. If we connect the resistor down here to ground, like you normally would for an emitter follower, the transistor wouldn't be able to reproduce some of the signal, because it's already fully closed at zero volts base voltage. So instead, we connect it to the negative rail. That way, the transistor has all the headroom it needs to amplify the full signal. The value of that resistor isn't super important, by the way. It will mostly influence the DC offset of the output, and also its volume. A 22K resistor worked well for me here, giving us a roughly 3 volts peak-to-peak -peak output with an offset of about minus 1 volt. To get rid of the latter, we'll simply AC couple the output using a 10 nanofarads capacitor. We can use such a small coupling cap here, since the signal barely has any low end left anyway. And yeah, our filter does remove a big chunk of the signal's low end, while also introducing a bit of bite via the added resonance. Great. Almost done. Now all that's left to do is properly mix both signal paths together. For that, we'll first set up an op-amp in the inverting configuration. This configuration is great for mixing audio signals, since it isolates the different inputs from each other. You can learn more about this in my video on designing an audio mixer from scratch. Next, we'll need to pick values for our three resistors. The one in the op-amp's feedback path determines the overall gain of the mixer, while the other two resistors in the input paths set the individual gain for the two signals. With this in mind, I settled on using a 100k resistor for the drum sound, a 10k resistor for the noise, and a 33k resistor in the feedback path, giving me an approximately 10 volts peak-to-peak -peak signal at the output, with a nice balance between drum and snare wires. I'm pretty happy with how this sounds, but there are two bonus features I'd like to implement. First, a CV input for the drum sound's bass pitch. And second, one for controlling the snare wire sound. For the pitch CV input, there's a super simple solution. Keeping the attack stage transistor open to varying degrees. Because remember, if that transistor is open, the oscillator's frequency increases. To open it, we can simply connect our control voltage to the 47k resistor at the transistor's base, instead of connecting it to ground. Then, the oscillator's behavior will be unchanged at 0V CV, but the pitch will increase as we push it up. Seems to work just fine. We can set the drum's bass pitch using the tune potentiometer, and then increase it from there via the control voltage. Great. Ideally, I'd also like to adjust the intensity with which the CV is affecting the pitch. To do that, you might be tempted to simply put a variable voltage divider between the CV input and the 47k resistor. Unfortunately, this would mess with the capacitor's discharging process, slowing it down significantly which would in turn affect the sound of the attack. So we need to make sure that the impedance here stays the same. 
And we can achieve that by buffering the attenuated CV with a simple op-amp buffer. That way, the impedance between the transistor's base and the buffered CV is independent of the attenuation we apply. Sounds great to me. The attenuator allows us to manipulate the drum's pitch in a much more subtle way. Next, we'll add a CV input for the snare wire sound. This is thankfully super simple. We only need to adjust the decay of the envelope that is controlling the swing type VCA. To do that, we'll simply establish a second path for that envelope's capacitor to discharge through. If we combine a 22K resistor with a PNP transistor to create this path, we can open or close it via a voltage we apply to the PNP space. At 0 volts CV, the transistor is fully open, allowing the cap to quickly discharge via the 22K resistor. And if we increase it from there, the transistor will gradually close down, slowing the cap's discharging process. And yeah, this does allow us to adjust the amount of snare wire sound we add. Great. With this final feature implemented, let's hear what kinds of snares we can get out of our circuit by tweaking all of the controls together. And with this, we've now got a pretty versatile analog snare drum in a straightforward little circuit. If you try building it for yourself, let me know how it went in the comments. Ideas for how to improve the circuit are very welcome too. If you'd like to support the channel, consider becoming a member on my Patreon page. Or check out the lineup of Eurorack DIY kits I develop in collaboration with Ericasynths. You can get most of my designs as complete bundles containing a set of components, a PCB and panel, and an extensive write-up in the Arikasynth's webshop. The snare is now available too. Links are in the description. Anyway, thanks for watching, and until next time. See ya!